people were turning up tonight. Originally, the NUT had agreed to host this rally in our headquarters uh, just around the corner, but I think within 24 hours of us announcing the date and the venue, it was clear that we couldn't have fitted you all in to NUT headquarters, so we immediately switched to a new venue. So I'm, I'm pleased you've, you've all turned up. Uh, this is a, clearly a very important rally, as, as your attendance recognises. We are now, um, what, 13 years into the war on terror, which George Bush and Tony Blair said would make the world a safer place. And I think it is quite clear that it has done nothing of the kind. And in fact, what it has done, as, as the title of, of this, uh, this rally suggests, is create a world in which one particular section of our community is being demonised and marginalised and is feeling under extreme attack and, and suspicion. We condemn all attacks on individuals or groups of people for, uh, for religious reasons, uh, whatever their faith. But I think we all recognise, and I, I hope we would recognise, that, that it is uh, the Muslim community in this country that, that is facing a particular virulent form of racism and discrimination, and that's why we're here tonight. That's why we've got this panel of speakers uh, to talk uh, to talk about that. Uh, as well as that, speakers, we are going to have a few contributions from the floor, where people are going to talk about particular activities or initiatives that they've been involved in. We're aiming to finish at about half past eight, uh, quarter to nine. So, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, who will be well known to you, if not having heard him speak, hopefully having read some of his articles, he's written very comprehensively and not authoritatively about the war on terror and the situation in the Middle East and, and, and elsewhere. So would you please give a big hand to Seamus Mill from The Guardian. The Western war in the Muslim world. And of course, that's feeding in directly into killings and violence uh, on the ground. And the latest one we've seen in the last couple of days in the United States, in Chapel Hill in North Carolina, where three Muslims were killed in an attack that has all the hallmarks of an Islamic, uh, is, is, it, an Islamophobic hate crime that would have in any other circumstances been called a terrorist attack. And the official response to every jihadist-inspired terror attack has always been to pour petrol on the flames. It happened in 2001 when the response to the attacks in New York and Washington was George Bush's launching of the war on terror itself and the campaign of violence, invasion, occupation, torture and kidnapping that was launched throughout the Muslim world. It happened here in 2005 after the bombings in London where a whole raft of repressive legislation was passed by the Blair government which itself launched a new war campaign in Afghanistan. And it's happened after the horrific atrocities in Paris at Charlie Hebdo and the Jewish supermarket. Instead of standing with the victims, let alone recognizing France's role in the war on terror, in the wars, multiple wars and intervention, in, interventions in the Muslim world, they made the freedom to insult Islam somehow a core Western value, applicable to no other religion, of course, or set of beliefs. And they sponsored a demonstration led by an array of tyrants and warmongers. And the same day, voted in the French Parliament by 488 votes to one, to step up France's role in the war in Iraq. And that Islamophobic climate in politics and the media feeds a violent backlash on the street. We saw it in France, in Avignon, where a Muslim was stabbed to death in the aftermath of the attacks. Just as Mohammed Salim was killed in 2013 in Birmingham in another Islamophobic 
race day to Tappens, an honour to be here with his daughter tonight. And as I said, three Muslims who were killed in North Carolina on Tuesday. But all these attacks by white killers are always treated as somehow crazy, uh, insane mental problems, rather than the way any similar type of attack by a Muslim would be treated in every case as Muslim. And it's actually, the latest attacks have been barely reported in the United States in the wider Western media. media. And it's that double standard that fuels hatred and violence and incomprehension of what's actually taking place and why in this country and around the Western world. And every time there's such an attack, they blame everything except the war itself. They blame the psychology of the killers, religion, conservatism, something called non-violent extremism. They even blame the internet and Facebook, Islam itself. Anything but the war that they have waged for 14 years in the Muslim world in one state after another with disastrous and brutal and violent consequences. Not to say that there aren't other factors, of course, poverty, racism, criminality, colonial history, and yes, tech theory, ideology. But without the wars and occupations that have been waged throughout the last 14 years in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Palestine, the drone slaughter that has been waged week after week by the United States and its allies. Those attacks clearly wouldn't have taken place. After all, it's what the attackers say themselves. Even in the Charlie Hebdo case, which was supposed to be about the abuse in the cartoons, even the Kouachi brothers said it was for the children of, of, in Palestine, Afghanistan and Iraq. But you don't just have to listen to what the killers them say, themselves say every time. It's also the fact there were no such attacks in Britain, in Europe, before 2001. And the 9-11 attack itself was, of course, an explicit response to the United States military and political role, role in the Middle East. So the warnings have been clear enough, not just from people like us who said that this would happen in 2001 and ever afterwards, the, the Western government's intelligence services themselves said that this would be the consequence, and this was the consequence. But the war on terror has now become a permanent war, and even a self-perpetuating war that has spread from Afghanistan to Iraq, Pakistan to Yemen, Somalia to Libya, while support for Western-backed dictators has deepened since the Arab uprisings from Egypt to the Gulf. And we're now living with the blowback of the first phase of the war on terror. IS, ISIS, is itself the direct product of the Iraq bloodbath and the sectarian divide and rule strategy that was imposed by the United States and Britain during the occupation. ISIS is the Frankenstein monster of the war on terror. And now we're seeing a return to the Iraq war. New bases in the Gulf. Britain's just opened a new base in Bahrain. Talking about sending 2,000 more troops to the Middle East. The war has become a permanent mechanism to enforce control of this region and its resources. And of course, it's taken a bewildering turn. We've seen the Western power switching from supporting rebels in Syria to opposing them and branding their violence uh, terrorism. So it's hardly any wonder, same thing happened in Libya, hardly any wonder that some young Muslims from around Europe and beyond are confused about what their own government's view is and they end up in prison thinking that they were actually on the same side as the British and other European governments. But IS will not be beat by more intervention and, bo and bombing. It's only, it will mutate just like it itself is a mutation because it's a response to that war and intervention and brutality. It's only Iraqis and Syrians that can liberate and rebuild their own country. The consequences here are clear enough. It's due to feed Islamophobia, the new racism of our time, and the unofficial ideology of the war on terror, and the double standards without limit. So where the burning of a soldier captive in the most horrific circumstances by IS is rightly branded a horrific atrocity, but the incineration of a 13-year-old boy in Yemen two weeks ago
by American drone strikes is barely reported. The result is loss of liberties, increased surveillance, increased social control, the toxic targeting of Muslim schools, of universities, of councils, even nursery children are now suspected of so-called extremism and the poisoning of community relations throughout our society. So to fight Islamophobia, you have to oppose the war on terror that fuels and legitimizes it and fosters broader forms of racism and anti-Semitism. It has to be opposed in the media, in politics and on the streets. It's designed to intimidate Muslims, separate them from the rest of the community and drive them out of politics, turn communities against each other for a war in the, in the service of a war that is in another, none of our interests. To end the war and oppose Islamophobia and beat it, that's the challenge of our time. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, well, I was asked to speak about four things, but first of all, I'll just give a short account of myself. I was born out of an anti-war movement. People like myself uh, and a lot of girls and boys of my age uh, were poly politicized um, and a generation like me was politicized uh, because of the anti-war movement. A decade ago, the war on terror, we said that the war on terror would make our lives here a very dangerous place here, at home and abroad. I'm going to, I'm going to touch on three uh, main points. One is the racist attack on the Rahman in Tahamnitz, Islamophobia in the media, and the counter-terrorism bill. So this is at the front page uh, last Friday's e evening standards. For those of you who can't see it, let me read it out to you. It says the mayor spent nine million pounds on council palace, leader of the poorest borough of Ice Hospital to turn into town hall. I don't know many of you know town hall quite well, but the current town hall is in a very expensive rented building, uh, which is in the south of the borough and difficult to reach for people. And it was a decision that was made by previous uh, councils, Lib Dem and then Labour. So the plan was to bring the derelict Royal London Hospital back into public use, to regenerate the Whitechapel area, and which would create new jobs and homes, and also, very importantly, to locate the town hall in the heart of the borough to make it more accessible for residents. So in fact, the story about the plans for a new town hall is a good one. But when it comes to the mayor of Town Hamlets, Luther Rahman, Britain's first directly elected Muslim mayor, true is first casualty. Literally week after week, there are stories in the media which depict the Town Hamlets mayor as hotbed of Taliban-led, anti-Semitic, homophobic, corrupt extremist mayor who wins by intimidating voters and committing post war In one shape or another, these charges have been repeated by the Home Secretary uh, and then the local government secretary as well, and also by BBC Panorama. And they have, uh, they have been driven by the Labour Party, who apparently can't believe that the voters of Tahamnitz have the cheek to elect a non-Labour candidate. Yet the truth could be no further from the headlines. Despite the headlines about homophobia, we in Tahamnitz, we have welcomed the 2011 Islam and Gay Pride demonstration into the borough. I can assure you, this is not a normal behaviour of a homophobe. The facts are, despite the head headlines uh, about fraud and corruption, the Pricewater Coopers reported uh, at the cost of one million pounds Tahamnitz Council found no evidence of fraud or criminality, no bias in the distribution of grants. But there is something rotten in this focus on the allocation of grants. Uh, it's not an accident. Some people have taken issue that the, the fundamental link has been between deprivation and hardship in our society. It's not an accident that black and Asian communities have the lowest paying jobs, live in the worst housing uh, crisis, um, and are represented less. Some communities care, carry the legacy of disadvantage. Uh, they struggle with, and it is our duty to support them. Tao Hamlet is one of the poorest boroughs. Poverty is disproportionately entrenched in the Bangladeshi community in the borough. But when it comes to look for Rahman, it's an open session. Uh, it appears that there is no smear you can't make, and some are actually quite laughable. I mean, there's been one charge at him. Oh, is that better? There's one charge at him. It's, it's, it's quite ludicrous that. Um, Apparently, the charges were the Bangladeshi voters were bribed by local Rahman supporters with lollipops and cups of teas and currants. I mean, the, I mean, if you know Asians, we like our food, but it does seem that it's stretching a bit. 
I think there is because the racism running through the political attacks on Tahamans. The attacks made by Eric Pickles have not, nothing to do with property in public life. If the Tories were really concerned about that, they would be sending the police into the boardrooms of our banking industry. They have everything to do to do a fully disguised thing. They outline the UK by pandering the prejudice about Muslims. The attacks are also coming from people who see the Muslim community as an inherent threat, as an as an inherent threat to modern Britain. They're coming from people who see Muslims uh, as a second-class citizen who just shut up and be grateful. For all the talk about British citizenship, if you are a Muslim, you express your citizenship rights and criticize your foreign policy, you will soon find the limits of the concept of citizenship because you will quickly be tarred as an apologist or worse. This is Islamophobia and it needs to, res needs to be resisted. The price of not resisting is highly damaging. We are told as Muslims should engage in mainstream, but what kind of message does it send to Muslim youth in Tahamans when they see that their mayor, who has done that, is subject to a witch hunt to drive them out of public life? You could forgive people for thinking there is no route to politics unless you totally survive to political establishment and, uh, and, uh, and you're an apologist uh, about your identity. I refuse to be an apologi apologetic about who I am. I refuse to apologize for the fact that I believe that the appeal of Islamic extremism are heavily rooted in the extremism of Western foreign policy that has presided over the oppression and mass murders of countless thousands of Muslim men, women and children. I refuse <laughs> I also refuse to accept that we can't fight racism and Islamophobia. Tahamis, as you know, I think that another reason that Tahamis has been on the attack is because Tahamis has a rich history of fighting back. There has a, there's a strong history in the left, from the French Huguenots to the Catholic, to the Jewish community, to the black community, and now the Bangladeshi community. It, uh, and the second point I wanted to quickly touch upon was Islamophobia. Just, let's just look at last week, the amount of attacks from the media on the Muslim community. Uh, Kathy, Kathy Newman, for example. Channel 4 is known to have this, the ethos of having an alternative voice. Kathy Newman lying about being dragged out of the mosque. Then, to find out, thank, thanks to keyboard journalism, because everybody's a journalist now, uh, we can kind of, we have been able to prove her wrong. There is actually women that attend that mosque very well. There are uh, kickboxing facilities for women, which she obviously didn't know. Let's look at the Chapel Hill murders. Dia Baraka, 23. Second year dental student Yusuf Muhammad, his wife, 21, Reza Muhammad, Abu Salha, 19 year old architecture. Uh, two of them had been married for only two months. The family said they were gems of the community. And it was a senseless and heinous murder as a hate crime. And it took 12 hours for this to be reported. 12 hours. The father says, My daughter told us we have a hateful neighbour. However, Richard Dawkins. The supporter of the guy who murdered them was a strong supporter of Richard Dawkins, it is clear. But given this, he is now trying, Richard Dawkins is now trying to pound into the heads of his supporters that the murderer, Mr. Hicks, was an anti theist and fought to murder over a parking feud. So Richard Dawkins theorizes this, and we have John Snow who follows suit by saying it. This is investigators have found that there was no account of hate crime, but it was uh, over parking feud. It's ludicrous. However, he did respond and say um, that he apologises. However, uh, they are decent and hinting that Muslims were non beings and quite the contrary. So, repeatedly, we have seen racism, Islamophobia in the media, and this is just last week. Now, I asked some of my friends on Facebook how do they feel as Muslims living in the UK, and here are some of the responses. Um, some of the responses have been that. Like, we're not human, hated, abused, killed. British Muslims are like feeling, being like foreigners in their own country. Uh, one was, how many Muslims have to be killed, attacked, spat, at, ridiculed and degraded before Islamophobia becomes as offensive as anti-Semitism. Now, I'm just going to quickly touch, I think my time's probably running up, but quickly touching upon the counter-terrorism bill, which is a draconian legislation which will target Muslims, whether they're violent and non-violent extremists, means that they will use it to beat any anti-establishment voices. They will start with the Muslims and move on to others. They will attack uh, university campuses and nurseries, as St. Mr. said. It's so hypocritical of the government to clamp down on freedom of speech. We're told it's for our safety, but we do not feel safe. Then Charlie Hebdo, which is a racist Islamophobic magazine. I hope I can say this and be critical of Charlie Hebdo. 
and not support the murder. And they, so, so without being against the killing, they played against the racist narrative and the targeting of minority groups, which isn't fair. Now, we know that Muslims in the UK are feeling like victims, um, and we know that in the, in the cinema, at the moment, there's a film of Martin Luther King uh, and Fight Against Racism, Wage in Selma. In the battle against racism, you are either on one side or the other. And I'm proud to say, uh, and in the battle against Islamophobia, you're either on one side or the other. I'm proud to say, to be here tonight, and I know that in the fight against racism and Islamophobia, with your support and solidarity, you will prevail. As a Muslim, as a human being, I'm really pleased that all of you could make it here today. It means a lot for me, and I'm sure the rest of the Muslim community in the UK, for this solidarity. If there is any organisation in the UK with a strong history of supporting minority groups, it is the Stop the, Wall, Stop the Wall movement. Thank you very much. Distinguished speakers and representing my union, the National Union of Teachers. As Alex has said, we're affiliated to the Stop the War Coalition and have been, I think, since 2003. But in, in that year, of course, we marched many thousands of NUT members, many more thousands of our students marched against the war in Iraq, the illegal war in Iraq. We all know that we're still seeing the consequences of that illegal war in international politics. We're also still seeing them in our schools. Every terrorist attack, every military bombing campaign leads to more tension in our society, leads to more tensions in our schools. And it's very important for a teachers union to react, to support our members, to support the children in these challenging situations. So we, across the period since then, we've issued uh, materials about how to teach controversial subjects. We've issued materials about the question of Muslim dress in schools and school uniform supported materials. We've issued materials about challenging Islamophobia. We're very proud of the work we do with a number of other organisations, United Against Fascism, Hope Not Hate, we stopped with uh, Show Racism in the Red Card where we've got some fantastic materials out that are being used in schools up and down the country. But what I want to talk about is how schools react when the government says you have to follow the prevent agenda, you have to teach British values, and the challenges those present, and the way that, that some of the consequences of those uh, policies can be extremely damaging to the ability of a teacher to work to promote social cohesion, to allow children to express themselves and talk through the challenges that children of all faiths and none are, are looking at. So I want to tell you an example, a, a real example, from a teacher that I've spoken to extensively about this, this example. It's illustrative, I believe, of what's going on in schools up and down the country. This is a teacher in a school in the East End of London. It's a mainly Muslim school. It was the week after the Charlie Hebdo atrocity. The teacher has a, a, a regular tutorial period with her class where she talks, like it's part of the citizenship education, they talk about items that are in the news. She encourages the children to come forward to discuss what's going on in the world around them. It's a really important part of a wider education. It's a Muslim school, like I say, it's the week after Charlie Hebdo. It's on every news uh, outlet. They really like this teacher and they really trust this teacher. And the lesson starts off quite well and they talk about one topic after another. But nowhere in an hour will any of the children say anything about Charlie Hebdo. And you just have to stop and try and think what that means. This teacher did have enough of a relationship that she could talk to some of the girls after the lesson very quietly about what that was about. And it wasn't because the girls wanted to say they supported the terrorist atrocity at Charlie Hebdo. Some of them, however, did think that it's wrong to uh, use that image of the Prophet and that that should be banned. Others did think that it was wrong to use an image of the Prophet, that it shouldn't be banned, but it's a very foolish thing to do. Others think it's insulting. There were other opinions, but none of the children prepared to express that opinion, even with a the teacher they knew very well. And why? 
because their mothers had said to them, don't say a word. Don't say a word. The prevent your gender will mean that your name is taken to and it's given to somebody else, and therefore, no discussion happens. And this is very damaging to an ability to create a cohesive human society if we can't talk through the ideas that each of us share. And I think we can't say to those mothers of those children that they're wrong to think this way about it. Because there is so much evidence. I mean, it wouldn't have happened with this particular teacher. They wouldn't have been reported by this teacher. But you understand why the fear is there. In the summer, I spoke at a thousand strong meeting in Birmingham around the Trojan horse. I spoke on a platform that I was very pleased to share with some extremely strong Muslim women, Salma Yaqub, Shabana, Mahmoud, Empty, others, and Muslim clerics, Christian clerics. We were talking about the attack that the Muslim community in Birmingham felt under after those Trojan horse allegations. Now let's just, I need to say this, there were some government failures. I could say there was some evidence of conservative religious practice. But these are things to be discussed. There was no evidence whatsoever of inculcation of violent extremism. And yet a whole community felt under attack by that process. And there were very damaging consequences. Children who go to those schools, some of them being uh, told on the street, you're a terrorist, you're going to that school. Children, boys going to a mass GCSE, having to fight their way to a scrum of newspaper reporters who are carrying these stories, upsetting their mass GCSE. Parents feeling they can no longer be involved in their school because they don't know what happened. Those schools were it very hard to recruit teachers. So very poor things that have happened there, and all extremely mistaken. An approach which doesn't start with the community, but which starts outside the community. Which doesn't start with dialogue, but which starts with denouncement. An approach that that community, and I, think was Islamophobic. All of this leads to exaggerations in the media. So we heard BBC, there was a BBC report that told us that a school in Bradford, also caught up in Trojan Horse, that they had gender segregated sex education lessons. Oh my goodness, what a shock. Every school in the country practically has gender segregated sex education lessons, and that's quite sensible, and this school is castigated for it. Or a school in Tower Hamlets recently, which had been told by Ofsted it was outstanding, and then uh, Ofsted come in again, there's, there's some allegations, there's things to talk through in that school. But one of the things that's now reported about this school is that it's got gender segregated playgrounds. Now, we can have opinions about gender segregation. I've got opinions about them. I, I was a Presbyterian boy. I gave up my faith. I feel I'm very progressive on these questions. But this playground was segregated. The actual history of it was it was segregated because the boys were occupying too much of the playground with their games of football. So they created a space for the girls. And yet this is now reported as being part of some great big story about Muslims and gender segregation, and my goodness, if you were a Muslim, if you were anybody, wouldn't you think there's a dash of hypocrisy about this? When you think about David Cameron's school, George Osborne's school, Boris Johnson's school, Eton, gender segregated, class segregated, effectively segregated by race and by religion, isn't it a bit hypocritical of them to turn on this question. Shouldn't they remove the doom? Shouldn't they remove the beam from their own eye before they seek to remove a speck from someone else? It's a serious exaggeration of the issues. Uh, honestly, there are uh, there's an increase in attacks and negative attitudes about Jewish kids and Muslim kids, and teachers want to deal with them. And we need time, we need opportunity, we need support, we need to prioritize human rights education. We need education for tolerance, for cohesion, for respect and for love for one another. But that's challenged by the prevent agenda. It's challenged by the regime of tests and exams and standards in schools, because that all takes away the space from these things that we really need to do. We have to educate the next generation, we have to educate the society as we want to see it coming into being. And these things are challenged. 
They are not helped by the notion that we should teach British values. We see Ofsted looking at schools on British values, head teachers reacting to this, overreacting to us. Some schools, you open their website, I think it's only, I hope it's only one, but I've, I've been on this school's website, you open its website and start playing the national anthem because they want to demonstrate that they're teaching British values. Other schools where they have, where we've seen schools where there is, um, there are posters saying, we teach British values. And these things can be alienating because these are not British values. They are values we share. These are human, universal values that Muslims share and Christians share and Muslims share. And we need to talk about those if we're going to create a society that we want to see. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for being here tonight. There is so much to do. We have to fight this as well as we Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all. I would like to start my speech by express our condolences and sympathy to the family of the young men and women who killed in cold blood just recently, two days ago. Unfortunately, Many of us didn't hear about this incident until maybe 15 or 16 hours late because the media are not interested. They happen to be Muslims. And this is why it's not an attractive story actually to speak that Muslims here are the victims. If it is the other way around, if a Muslim committed such a crime, you will see all sorts of media outlets covering life all over the world. The other thing that this criminal who committed this crime, he called himself atheist. And I have a question to actually to ask. Do we have the right as a Muslim all over the world or as a Muslim community to blame atheist community, atheist organizations, atheist leaders and to ask them to give an apology or to condemn such an incident, a horrible incident? The question is no. We don't have the right to do that and we don't accept others to blame Muslims in every incident similar to that and ask them for apology and accusation. <laughs> I just came back from a conference called Islam and Democracy and the Muslim Brotherhood Contribution it was a great conference and Jeremy, John Reese and others were there contributing great discussion and debate and this is what we want really. And I'm here to speak about Islamophobia and about the war in terror, which in my opinion has got two major factors. One is domestic and the other one is international. Domestic factors Inequality, injustice, discriminations, all these sort of things affect what we are facing at the moment in our country. And internationally, we've seen the war in terror. We've seen how the international community failed to stop any war all over the world. In fact, it's the other, way, the other way around. They created and started many wars and still going on at the moment. Whether it is in Afghanistan, in Libya, in Iraq, in Palestine, and recently in Syria. Unfortunately, actually they started these wars and they couldn't stop it or they didn't want to stop it. I just want to say 
that Islam Islamophobia network organizations they just only issued the research in the United States saying that 57 million dollars is spent is spent on spending on spreading hate against Muslims 57 million dollars spent on spreading hate against Muslims in the USA I wonder how much Europe the haters in Europe spent and in particular in the UK it's interesting, it is interesting to have a similar research here in the UK to find how much these haters spent here to rise Islamophobia and racism here in the UK and there is a legitimate question as well to ask ourselves, the Muslims and our friends and the people who oppose Islamophobia and racism how much we put effort and spend money to counter that unfortunately it is very little amount comparing with what they spend and uh, just an example about that what's happened to Islamophobia watch I don't want to talk with us today he has to close the, 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 the website which did a great work exposing attacks on Muslims here in the country and in Europe and I believe this is what, 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 what this was because of the lack of funding and the lack of resources unfortunately this is what's happening now just despite the hard work the Muslim community are facing at the moment here in the in the UK and what you've seen in, in France recently after the terror attack in France the French government decided that Islamic identity is a threat to the Republic and we've seen that in other European countries and we've seen that here in the UK when they produce the so-called counter-terrorism bill which I think it is targeting mainly the Muslim community and turning our country to a police state which we will not accept and we will not tolerate we tell them as Muslims if you want to know the Muslim community really well here away from this tiny minority extremists which they are in every community and every faith Please go to the East London Mosque, for example, where they, when, when this 77 bombing took place, they offered the injured treatment and shelter. When Muslims went to the hospitals to give blood to help their fellow citizens. If you want to know about the Muslim community, come to Finsbury Park Mosque which I have the privilege to be the chair of this charity where you can find that we open our door to everybody we turn this place from a hostile atmosphere to a cohesive atmosphere but unfortunately the media didn't want to realize that didn't want to see that they want to keep this mosque as the mosque which is responsible in every single attack in the, in, in, in the, in the world. They, we are the super, the super power, actually. The Finsbury Park Mosque has linked with every single attack in the whole world. Every time anything happened, the media came to us and asked us, there is a link between, between your mosque. Actually, we became a super power, maybe Superman or Super Mosque or whatever. So, it's unbelievable. It is unbelievable what's going on. We open our doors to everybody. Our local, we have, a, we, we are lucky actually to have Jeremy as our local MP in, in his nation. And he's done a great job to bring communities together, to build these bridges between communities. And he has us changing this mosque from, as I said, from a hostile atmosphere to a cohesive atmosphere. We recently awarded we recently awarded a, a, an award, a quality award called Visible. I don't know if anyone heard about it because the media are not interested to talk about it. 
We are the only mosque in the country to award this award. And we are the third faith organization in the country, in the country to award this. But the media, the media didn't come to us to ask us about this. They come to us to ask us about radicalization and youth people going to Syria and so on. They don't want to see that, unfortunately. Finally, I just want to say that we worked with the Stop the War Coalition since 2001 when things happened in, in, in uh, Afghanistan, in Iraq and elsewhere. And we worked with them even here in this country in issues like inequality, discrimination, Islamophobia, racism, austerity. And we will keep working together in a partnership in every single issue related to justice and equality and social justice. Because this is our cause and this is your cause and no one will try to divide us from that. And we will hope that in the future we can do similar events like this between our organization as we've done before. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Islamophobia and it's increased, been increased over the last few years 
which much um, much of which has been perpetrated by the sensationalized media headlines and the general bias against Muslims in news reports and treatment within the legal system. My father was attacked because he was a Muslim, not because he was Asian, but because of his faith. Islamophobia is right. Islamophobic attacks continue to rise, fueled by sensationalized headlines run by media and also by the government's stance on treating all Muslims as terrorists. What hope is there for our kids and generations to come if we don't make a stand against all forms of hate? The Islamophobia has to stop and no person should be victimised or stereotyped because of their faith. Muslims should be embraced and respected like every other person in our inclusive society. We are the same, no different. I applaud the work of Stop the War Coalition are doing to address Islamophobia within this country and the impact they are making across the country. Stop the War has also been the forefront of pointing out that Islamophobia has dire international consequences. It has been used to legitimise endless, brutal foreign wars which only fuel further hostilities, cruelty and hatred between people. It's time the mainstream society, media and government places more importance on this growing problem, even more so after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, where racists are attempting to make gains and divide our communities. I will always continue to speak up against hatred and intolerance so that no one else has to go through a situation me and my family went through. This country has always operated between the through a tolerant cohesive society that celebrates diversity. Thank you very much. Alex, and thanks to everybody for, for coming here. We called this meeting after the events in Paris because we were very shocked by the events, but we were also very shocked at the response to the events because the whole question that was missing from any analysis of what went on in Paris, the attacks on Charlie Hebdo, the attacks on the Jewish supermarket, it seemed to me it was the whole question of where terrorism comes from, and in particular, in the 21st century, the role of the war on terror in terms of helping not to get rid of terrorism, but actually to increase the level of terrorism around the world. And we wanted to have this meeting to talk about the threats that the Muslim community was under, the problems that were being posed by the response after the, uh, after the French attacks, and to try to deal with the question of um, the double standards which the, uh, which the Muslim community faces. The events this week, which have already been referred to by previous speakers, we've had the death, the shooting, uh, execution style shooting of three young Muslims, one man and two women, one young family in um, North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, and I think many, many people have been outraged at the different responses to, from the media, from governments, from everybody, to those attacks compared with the attacks in Charlie Hebdo or indeed a whole number of other uh, terrorist attacks. There's been very, very little on the news. And when there has been things on the news, it's a very, very different approach. When you look at Chapel Hill, we're told that the person who committed these attacks was a lone, crazy person who just did this because he was alone and crazy. We were even told this was to do with a dispute over a parking place. Now, I think whatever we know and don't know about this case, I think we have to assume that if you don't have a parking place and you go and shoot three people of Muslim faith, in Muslim dress, um, in cold blood, it's not just to do with the parking place. And one of the parents of one of the victims put it very, very well. He said, when you live in a society like America, where absolutely everything is thrown at Muslims, where Muslims are blamed for terrorism, where Muslims are blamed for the way that they dress, where Muslims are blamed for the way that they pray, where they're blamed for the food that they eat, for all the different things, for the schools that they attend, when they're blamed for all of these things, he says, of course, then, when you have a dispute with a Muslim, you hate that person because you've been told to hate that person and you respond in that kind of way. And it seems to me that that is very, very important.
you're looking for us to understand. And when people say, you know, there's a load of soul searching that goes on, you have, you can listen to programs on the BBC from morning till night, which will ask you, you know, anguished questions about is there something in Islam which makes people violent, which makes people against women, which makes people do all those sorts of things. I think perhaps we should ask a different question, which is, is there something inherent in Western society that encourages attacks on Muslims of the sort that Maz has just described? I mean, no. Uh, 
smiled in his own tongue. He was meant to get rid of terror, democracy, human rights, women's rights. These were the things that's all on the agenda. Instead of which, terrorism has spread from Afghanistan to Pakistan right across the Middle East and across large parts of, the, uh, of Africa as well. And this is a spread which has been encouraged by occupations which were illegal, which destroyed whole communities, which destroyed the infrastructure in Iraq. And of course the allies of the Western powers who themselves helped to arm and sustain ISIS and the people that they now assail as such a horrible institution. They are a horrible phenomenon, but this is a phenomenon which has grown out of the war on terror, which our government took us into in the most crazy way. So we now have a vicious circle of more wars, more terrorism, more attacks on civil liberties, and more Islamophobia as a result of it. That is what is going on. And we have to try to break that vicious circle. That is one of the points of the meeting here tonight. And that brings me to my final point, which is, what are these things about? What is the counter-terror law all about? What is the prevent strategy all about? What is the government's view that somehow Muslims are okay if they stay indoors and never say anything political? But if they dare to be what are called non-violent extremists, that will just lead to violent extremism. This is the latest crackpot theory. From, uh, from this government. So in other words, you can't do anything if you're a Muslim or if you're a supporter of Muslims to stand up and oppose Israel's attack on Palestine, another 2,000 troops going to Jordan, or any of the other things we're talking about in the, uh, in the war on terror. This is an attack on the right to protest and it's an attack on free speech. We've got the biggest movement ever in this country against the war in Iraq. And it's a tremendous tragedy for the people of Iraq and for the people of this country that Tony Blair is still walking free and reputably, reputably is worth 50 million a year and the Iraqi people have suffered such a terrible loss and that we didn't stop that war 12 years ago. That is a terrible, terrible tragedy that that didn't happen. But it's also the case that people became politicised around that and have continued to demonstrate over all these issues and uh, many, many other issues as well. The government and the powers that be and the media want to stop people from demonstrating and protesting and saying that the government is wrong. They've even said now in London, this is with the climate change people, but they'll do it to all of us if they get the chance, they're saying that we have to pay to protest. They privatised the closing of roads so the police aren't going to do it anymore and we have to pay private stewards to do it for us. Well, I've got a message here from the Stop the War Coalition. That isn't going to happen ever. <laughs> that we're kind of better at stewarding than the police are most of the time. And that's a view that we certainly think we're better at stewarding than the privatised companies. The idea of um, G4 security or anybody else being people to do that demonstration. Please, we're not going down that road. So, we are going to also be campaigning for the right to protest. And this is part of the wider movement. And this is an urgent question. It's an urgent question because we said to them, when you start these wars, you'll destroy the lives of the Iraqis and the Afghans and the Libyans and all the other people whose lives they have destroyed. You will also destroy the political ability of people to organise here. And that is what we have to stop. So we're against civil, the attacks on civil liberties, we're against Islamophobia, and we are going to keep protesting and demonstrating. And I'm very, very pleased to be here tonight with this panel and with the fantastic speakers who've talked about all these different sorts of things because there is very little in this country more important than opposing racism and opposing war. And like with all these questions, we have to ask ourselves, which side are you on? I'm on the side of the Muslim community in this country. I hope everybody in the anti community is here. To all of the speakers, I want particularly to mention my good friend Mohammed Kozbar from Finsbury Park Mosque, because this is the go-to mosque when the media need a picture of a mosque in order to back up whatever ludicrous story they're putting out anywhere around the world. And his incredible patience in constantly explaining the great work done in Finsbury Park Mosque, the way it works with all communities, the way that he operates within the faith community locally with 
Jewish people, with Christian people, with Hindu people, with Sikh groups, and all the others. It's an example of the enormous contribution made to our society by the Muslim community, not just in my area, but all over the country. And I want that to be recognised. When we founded the Stop the War Coalition in 2001, 14 years ago, to oppose the Afghanistan war, we didn't really know where it was going to go. And yesterday there was a debate in Parliament in uh, Westminster Hall on uh, the situation in Afghanistan, it was put. And the Conservative MP, Keith Simpson, who introduced the debate, is actually a military historian. And so I wasn't quite sure, but I think he probably was at the first Afghan war himself. And that he gave us some lessons about the first Afghan war and the second Afghan war, and some rather excruciating levels of detail about the military performances and so on, and then went on to the decisions made by the British Army here, there, and everywhere, and then Kandahar and this, that, and the other. And I could stand it no longer. So I intervened and said, um, I'm really sorry to interrupt the member in the midst of his speech, but could he please just for a moment pause and reflect on the number of Afghan people that have died, the poverty that now exists in Afghanistan that is worse than it was in 2001, the drone attacks that are going on elsewhere, and the fact that the one of the biggest sources of refugee flows all around the world is Afghanistan. What kind of record is that for 14 years of Western intervention and Western occupation? That is the reality of what's happened in Afghanistan. And so we were established to oppose that war. But we were also established to oppose racism in any form. And every demonstration we have ever organized has always been not just token inclusive, it is absolutely inclusive of all elements and all communities within our society. That is the only way forward for a peace and anti-war movement to include everybody in it. So the war on terror announced by George Bush in January 2002 when he clearly showed his deep knowledge of the bitter history of the Middle East when he talked about a crusade without any sense of irony of what the crusades were actually about, where an early war on Islam were a form of Islamophobia. He didn't clearly understand that. And the war on terror led then to Guantanamo Bay, to extraordinary rendition, to the abuse of the human rights of people all across the world. It also led to the war in Iraq, it led later to Mali, to Libya, Syria, and so the list goes on. These wars, essentially for resources politically driven by the well-heeled lobbyists of the arms trade who sell the weapons of death to the governments that gladly use them to kill innocent people many thousands of miles away with drone attacks organized from TV screens in air-conditioned rooms in England or the USA. That is the reality of what the modern war is about. The oil companies make money, the mineral companies make money, the security companies make money, and the people lose. Hardly reported on the media yesterday was the deaths of another 300 people in the Mediterranean. Desperate people, absolutely desperate people, fleeing from wars in Somalia, Eritrea, Syria, Palestinians, and many others, going to Libya, not because they wanted to go to Libya, but because it was the only place, because of its instability, they could get into, and then trying to get desperately to Lampedusa. 300 died, 105 were saved. Hardly any coverage in most of the media. I raised the matter in the House of Commons this morning with William Hague, who's now the leader of the House, no longer Foreign Secretary, and pointed out that the EU's contribution to all this has been to cease the funding 
of the Italian system which was to search out for people at sea and rescue them, rescue those in peril on the sea and instead institute an EU border force which is designed to stop people getting to a place of safety, escaping from a place of danger. I am fed up with the hypocrisy that Europe supports refugees and Europe supports the victims of tyranny. Whilst at the same time we allow these poor and desperate people to drown in the Mediterranean. So I've written to David Cameron this afternoon and said, when you go to the EU heads of government meeting next weekend, will you raise this issue and demand a change of policy so we start saving people rather than watching them drown? But what drives this policy? What drives this policy through the European Union other than the growth of intolerance, the growth of racism, the growth of xenophobia across Europe, which denigrates the human rights of people from Africa and the Middle East to allow us to say, no more can we take these people, they must drown, that we can live our comfortable lives in Europe. Sorry, we live in one world where every life matters, every human being matters. I want human rights for everybody. into the whole question of racism within our own society. The history of racism in Britain is a nasty, brutal and bitter one. From the time that the Jewish people were expelled in the 13th century, allowed back in the 17th century, to the way in which every African person was deemed to be subhuman in order to gain general approval to the vileness of the slave trade and the genocide that went with the slave trade to the attacks on Jewish people fleeing to Britain in the 19th century from Russia or fleeing to Africa. We stand together in the Stop the War movement against racism in absolutely any form that it raises our heads within our society. And the anti-terror laws that have just been passed through Parliament are the latest chapter of a whole three, four decades of anti-terror legislation that's been passed through. I've been in pretty well every debate in Parliament on anti-terror laws during all the time I've been an MP, starting with the Prevention of Terrorism Act against the Irish people in the 1970s, before I became an MP. And there's a narrative that runs through these things. You set up a story, you set up an enemy, you set up a threat, and in return, executive detention, executive punishment, and executive orders. So under this latest piece of legislation, the Home Secretary can remove the passports of people if she feels fit, she can stop somebody travelling if she feels fit, and she can deny somebody, a British citizen, the right to return to the UK if she thinks fit. But she assured me on Monday night it was OK because they could appeal against it. I wasn't entirely clear how they were supposed to appeal against it if they weren't in this country in order to lodge their appeal because she had prevented them from coming back here in the first place. But she said she would write to me about that, so I'm looking forward to receiving that letter. The second part of the legislation is just as ominous, and that is that it requires all the um, institutions of higher education and universities to be active on the prevent strategy. Yasmin Qureshi and Peter Bolton South in the South East made an absolutely brilliant speech in this respect and pointed out that the uh, prevent strategy has actually fueled the rise of Islamophobia rather than reducing it because that, she believes, is what the whole thing was designed to do. The House of Lords objected to this because there are people in the House of Lords that have a genuine belief in freedom and free speech. And so they tacked on to the end of the section that says the universities must be wary of who speaks on their campuses, must check what they're going to say in advance. It'd be very difficult in my case, but I have no idea two weeks before a speech what I'm likely to say. I've no idea two minutes before I speak what I'd like you to say. So it'd be very difficult for me to answer that question, should I be invited to a university in the future? 
And yet, at the same time, they're told they've got to protect academic freedom and free speech. It's all in the same clause in this particular bill that's about to get the royal assent and become law. This whole thing is going to unravel somewhere. Surely, we want to live in a cohesive society. Our society is a multicultural, multi-faith society. We had a very interesting discussion about Islam and democracy today that uh, Mohammed Kosba was talking about earlier. We want that because we want to live in a world like that. You can't achieve that if we're driven by a foreign policy that denigrates a faith, denigrates a whole community, invades the rest of the world to please the arms manufacturers, the security industry, and the mineral industry, and the oil industry, you have to create that ghastly sense of xenophobia within our society. But I'm pleased at the way in which, across Europe, more and more people are standing up against racism. Those that stood up to defeat Golden Dawn in Greece, those that stood up in Germany against the growth of far-right extremism in Germany, those anti-racist groups all across Europe. We are part of that movement. We're part of that movement for peace, part of that movement for justice, part of that movement because of the kind of world we want to live in. All forms of racism are wrong, all forms of racism are evil, so let's bring up our children to understand that the strength of a society, the strength of a community, is respecting and understanding each other and working together to stop wars, working together for the common good, working together to bring about the decency we want in education, health, and so many other things. The world is in a very dangerous place. More people have died and are dying from wars all over the world, essentially wars about resources, fueled by Islamophobia in many cases. It's up to us, in the centre of a country that is very much part of those wars, and part of that war machine, and part of that NATO war machine, and part of that nuclear machine, to be the loudest possible voices for peace. Because we can do it, we will do it, and we are doing it. And that, in turn, gives a sense of good feeling and solidarity for those that are victims of war around the world. Solidarity on the streets of London means solidarity around the rest of the world. That's why we founded Stop the War Coalition, and that's why we'll stay around as long as it takes to bring about that decent, peaceful, free, respectful, and just world. Thank you very much.